thank you for coming, and thank you for the very, very gracious introduction. So, as Meredith pointed out, um, as computers and computer algorithms reach ever more deeply into our lives, there is an increasing concern that they embody societal values such as privacy and fairness and statistical validity and so on. And um, my work does strive to try to put these goals on a firm mathematical foundation. And my hope today is to give you a little bit of the flavor of how someone like me goes about trying to answer a question like this. So what is some of my thinking? I'll give two, or if time permits, three examples. And uh, I will include work that is very much um, in progress right now. So we are going to, in the end, use coins for fairness. But my goal in talking about them right this very minute is to, to just give you a little bit of the language of probability in case this is foreign to you, because not everybody here has had a probability class. So what do we mean by a fair coin? Most of you would say, well, it'll come up heads with probability a half. What does that statement mean? Implicit in it is the idea that you have some sort of repeatable experiment. You can flip the coin many times. If you flip it a thousand times, your belief, your guess, is that if it's fair, it should come up about 500 heads and um, not too far away from that. So that's uh, one view of the definition of a fair coin. And um, you might wonder, if you have a coin, can you test for fairness? And the answer is sure, and you have to think about why. But you can ask me about that later if you want. But when we talk about whether an algorithm is fair, you'll also maybe be thinking, can I actually test for fairness? So it's the same kind of exercise. So very, very briefly, we need a sample space of our experiment. So the sample space is simply all the possible outcomes. If I flip a coin once, the sample space is just head or tail. That's it. It's a pair. Uh, those are the two elements in the sample space. If I roll a single die, there are six possible outcomes. If I'm looking at medicine, then I may be concerned with how many months uh, um, will somebody survive in a five-year follow-up study. So the number of answers there is 61. It could be 0, 1, 2, 3 months, 4 months, and so on, up to 60 months. So notice that when we had the die and we rolled it, the repeatable experiment was the multiple rolls. When it comes to a uh, number of months survived in a follow-up study, that's not one person who's being tested many times. It's many people. So we have to understand a little bit about where our repetitions are coming from. So that's the sample space of an experiment. Oh, and there are also countably and infinite, uh, uncountably uh, infinite sets. If you're used to thinking about a draw from a Gaussian distribution, that would be an uncountably infinite set. We won't need that today. Now, not all outcomes have the same probabilities. If I flipped a fair coin, of course, it would be 50-50, the same probability, the same with the die, one in six. Um, but suppose I flip two coins. So the number of heads in the two flips of a fair coin is going to be 0, 1, or 2. But they don't all have the same probability. And the best way to think about this is to think about flipping two fair coins. We'll call one of them the green coin and one of them the blue coin. And they can be flipped in either order. So there's a 50-50 chance of 0 or 1 on the green coin. And then, independently, there's a 50-50 chance of 0 or 1 on the blue coin. So each of the paths through this diagram has probability 1 fourth, but two of those paths result in one head. So um, it's twice as likely that we'll see one head than that we'll see zero heads. That seems so obvious to us, but this device of thinking about the blue and the green coin this wasn't even known to Leibniz, who developed calculus. So a few hundred years ago, 350 years ago or so, people didn't understand this so well. Now it's absolutely bread and butter. 
we'll, we'll need the notion of a probability distribution, which is simply a list for each possible outcome of how probable it is. So these are numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. And that's uh, the basic tutorial. Notice that um, sometimes we really have no way of knowing which outcome is, is more um, is the case. And that doesn't mean that they're equally likely. So for example, we might talk about what's our belief about the probability of intelligent life on Mars. Either there is intelligent life on Mars or there isn't. Just because we don't know which is which doesn't mean that they're equally likely. Given all of the other things we know about life, they will not have equal likelihood. And the last notion we'll need is conditional probability. So I could talk about what's the probability of rain? Well, already you should say, what do you mean what's the probability of rain? What's my sample space? Am I talking about days in the year in Cambridge? Am I talking about days in the year in, in California? Am I talking about days in Cambridge Union, California? So let's say Cambridge in October. What's the probability of rain on a random day in Cambridge in October? And what's the probability of rain given that we observe that it's cloudy? So conditional probability talks about how we update our beliefs in the light of evidence. And this is absolutely fundamental to the scientific method. There are mathematical ways of doing it, but you should just know that this is what conditional probability will do for us. OK, so now you're armed with the language that you'll need to understand uh, at least the definition of differential privacy. So here's, for a moment, going to be my computational model. I have a data analyst who interacts with a database in a very abstract way. She asks a question like, <laughs> what happened to Q1? She asks a question like, how many, what is the fraction of people in the data set that, that are over six feet tall? And she gets an answer. The fraction is, you know, um, uh, 40 percent. And then based on that, she might choose a new question, uh, how many people like muffin tops, and gets an approximate answer to that, gets an answer to that. So that's our model of a data analyst interacting with the database. The data, the question could be something very, very complicated. It could be a multi-part study, it could be um, a mathematic, it could be a computer algorithm, it doesn't matter, we're just gonna abstract it away. Question, answer, question, answer. First heart study on the data set, second heart study on the data set, which is informed by the outcomes of the first heart study, and so on. Okay. So this is a very general model. Um, it's used in some sense in the, you can imagine it in the census, in epidemic detection based on over-the-counter drug purchases. You might want to analyze loan application data for uh, evidence of discrimination. Um, so there can be all sorts of rich and juicy things in this data set, and we want to do these things while preserving privacy. Now this is a problem that's quite old, and very specifically, we can find some results on these sorts of things from 1965, which, and we'll talk about that later. Now, as Meredith mentioned, many people think about de-identifying data. So the, the dream in de-identified data is you start with a database, um, and some algorithm, M, chomps on the database for a while, stripping out certain things and averaging and aggregating others, and produces a de-identified data set. That's the hope. And in fact, once that happens, we don't even need the original database, the algorithm can go away, and the analyst can knock herself out by looking at the de-identified data set. And the problem with this approach is that a number of studies have shown that de-identified data isn't. Either it isn't de-identified, or it is no longer data. So it's just <laughs> So you might say, well, why don't we just restrict ourselves to statistical queries? Now, this is really intuitive. A statistic is a quantity computed from a sample. The reason statistics works as a field is it really doesn't care whom you have sampled, it just cares that you've sort of sampled enough people with enough of the right distribution. So that seems really privacy preserving. And yet there are problems. So a simple example would be a differencing attack. 
Suppose we ask the following question. How many living physics Nobel laureates floss their teeth regularly? And then we ask, the, we get the exact answer to this. And then we ask the question, how many male living physics Nobel laureates floss regularly? So both of these are pretty large sets. There are quite a number of male living physics Nobel laureates, but there's only one female living physics Nobel laureate, Donna Strickland, as of October 2nd. And so if you took one answer and subtracted it from the other, you would learn whether or not Donna <laughs> Strickland flosses regularly, which of course is a very personal piece of information. So this is a simple example, it's a simple attack, but it's one thing you should worry about. One thing we've learned from cryptography is if anybody finds a way of breaking something, there are probably a ton of other ways of breaking that and simple variations of it and complicated variations of it. Like, it's, it's always the tip of the iceberg. And indeed, what we call the fundamental law of information recovery, I missed the citation here, the first version was due to Diener and Nisim in 2003, essentially says that overly accurate estimates of too many statistics completely destroys privacy. And the definition of overly accurate is tied to the definition of too many. So if we're going to break privacy, and we can ask lots and lots, then we can make them pretty inaccurate and still manage to break privacy. If we're going to just be able to ask a few questions, then to prove this theorem, you need, you need uh, pretty tight accuracy. So those two are connected. Okay. So here we are at Radcliffe. Um, this is a picture of Cecilia Payne Gopershchin. So maybe the astronomers know who she is. She is uh, the first woman to obtain a PhD in astronomy and the first person to obtain a PhD in astronomy at Harvard. Um, she uh, was responsible for estimating the great abundance of hydrogen in uh, stars and realizing that the stars have a very different composition from Earth, from the Earth. Okay. So here is Cecilia Payne, she's in the data set, and the analyst is, is talking to the data set, and the question is, what does privacy mean for Dr. Payne? So what are the guarantees or the promises that we'd like to make to her? The one possibility would be to say, the analyst interacting with the database can't learn anything new about Cecilia Payne. And this is, in fact, the uh, heart of the desideratum that was articulated by the sta uh, statistician Tordelinius in 1977 when the statistics community was trying to get its hands on what is, uh, what is um, uh, a statistical database. What does it mean that it's statistical and not about individuals? So the problem with that is if we can't learn anything new about the people in the database, what is the point? So suppose that I'm from Mars and I believe that all humans have two left feet. And I interact with the statistical database and I learn that the vast majority of humans have one left foot and one right foot. So I used to believe that Dr. Payne had two left feet. Erroneously, I believed this. And then I interacted with the database, and now my beliefs about her have changed. I've learned something new about her. Have I compromised her privacy or not? Well, suppose she had not been in the data set. Suppose she had opted out, and she'd been replaced in the data set by Henrietta Swan Leavitt, another Harvard astronomer who observed a certain mathematical relationship between the period of variable stars and their peak brightnesses. And this relationship turned out to be very valuable for estimating distances across space. So presumably, because this is a statistical database, we would learn the same things if Payne had been replaced by Levitt. 
all we needed was enough people to learn that the vast majority of people have one left foot and one right foot. So ideally, we'd learn the same things if pain is replaced by another random member of the population. And that's what differential privacy captures. It says in English that the outcome of any analysis is essentially equally likely, independent of whether any individual joins or refrains from joining the data set. In other words, the probability distribution on outcomes is very robust to small changes in the data set. Pain goes away, Levitt joins, Pain's replaced by Levitt, Annie Jump Cannon joins. So you've seen some of these things, these terms. The likelihood here, what's our repeatable experiment? Our algorithms are going to flip coins. They're going to introduce randomness. And when we talk about measuring likelihood, we mean with the database fixed, likelihood as we vary the coins of the algorithm. So you could run it many times with different coins, and you'd get uh, probability distribution and outcomes. And essentially equally likely says simply that similar databases should give rise to similar probability distributions on outputs. And that's basically the definition. So what it means is if a bad event from my perspective is very unlikely when I'm not in the data set, it's going to be very unlikely even if I am because the probability distribution on the outputs will not change much whether I'm in there or not in there. So if one is analyzing power consumption data and a bad outcome for me is that the police come and bust me for maybe use of grow lights, um, well, if that's very unlikely to happen if my data are not included, then it will be unlikely to happen if they are included. Um, the next example has to do with genome-wide association studies. I'm going to skip it now, but ask me about both of these examples during the questions if you uh, wish. So what differential privacy does is it allows us to separate harms that can happen to us based on the teachings of the database from harms that happen to us as a result of our choosing to participate in the database. So let's think about a, a medical data set where we are analyzing the effects of smoking. And we learn by analyzing this data set that smoking causes cancer. From the perspective of a smoker in the data set, let's say, in some sense, I mean, it's really good news because the smoker then learns to quit. But for a moment, let's say that this is bad news for the smoker because it means her insurance premiums are going to rise. So what the differential privacy ensures is that those same teachings would be learned independent of whether she participated or not. Now, of course, the whole point of a medical database in the case of, in, for study is to learn things like smoking causes cancer precisely so that people learn uh, not to smoke or that they should enter a smoking cessation program. So the hope was that by having very strong privacy protection that makes things essentially the same in terms of their privacy loss risk, whether you are participating or not, that you would feel safe to participate. So it's a strong definition of privacy. And you might wonder, why is anything possible at all? How can you possibly get any utility whatsoever when you have such a strong privacy guarantee? And one thing that we've learned um, from machine learning, from that whole field of AI and machine learning, is that stability to small changes in the data set allows you to properly generalize, which means to port the things that you have learned by analyzing your data set to the population as a whole. That's the whole point of machine learning, and it's also the whole point of statistical learning. And so stability is both necessary and sufficient for that. So stability, or differential privacy, will preserve Payne's privacy and protect against overfitting of the data. So in some very real sense, privacy and utility are actually aligned, as opposed to being in conflict with each other. So here's a simple example 
it's not quite in the model that we discussed, but it's just a simple example that actually dates back to 1965, but we're going to analyze it in modern terms. So it was developed by Warner in order to uh, uh, question people, survey people, about embarrassing or even illegal behaviors. It's going to give plausible deniability. So the question is, did you floss last night? So what I'm interested in is the fraction of people in the room who flossed last night. And we could carry out this study in a privacy-preserving way as follows. I would give you the following instructions, and I would tell you to carry them out very privately. Okay. So flip a fair coin. If that coin is heads, you're going to answer completely randomly, having nothing to do with the truth. You flip again, and you respond yes if your coin, second coin came up heads, and no otherwise. But if the outcome of the first coin was tails, you're going to answer honestly. So you can see that whether the truth is yes, you flossed, or no, you didn't, in both cases, you might end up saying yes, and in both cases, you might end up saying no. So this is where the plausible uh, deniability comes from. And the privacy analysis is straightforward. The probability that you say yes, given that the truth is yes, we're interested in this ratio, divided by the probability that you say yes, given that the truth is no, that's going to be three. If the truth is yes, you say yes if the first coin is tails, probability a half, or the first coin is heads and the second coin is heads, probability a quarter, total probability is three quarters. If the truth is no, you'll say yes only if the first and second coins are heads, which as we saw earlier has probability of fourth. So the ratio between them is three. Um, same deal if you're out for outputting no. So it turns out it's very, very easy to reverse engineer the noise that we've added by all of this coin flipping and get quite nice approximations to the true fraction of people in the room who uh, flossed last night. Um, and if I want to have better privacy protection, what I'll do is I'll flip a coin that is, um, uh, uh, has a very small probability of tails. So you're very unlikely to have to answer honestly. Most of the time, you'll, most of the people will end up answering randomly. So you have to recalculate the privacy analysis, but you can force that ratio to be very close to one um, by answering honestly with much smaller probability. So let's go back. Remember that um, conditional probability let us say how we're going to update our beliefs in light of the evidence. So now, suppose the evidence is Meredith has flipped and her coin came, she says no. Well, it's not very good evidence because maybe if I had chosen my parameters ni nicely, I'd be essentially equally likely to see that no, whether she flossed last night or not. So in this updating of the, prob of the beliefs, very little is changing. There's very little information. Okay. And for the mathematicians here, this is the definition. Adjacent data sets are data sets that differ in the data of just one person. And uh, we say that uh, our algorithm gives us epsilon differential privacy if this equation holds, where the probability space is over the randomness introduced by our algorithms. And this parameter epsilon here is a measure of the privacy loss, or it's an upper bound on the privacy loss. Okay, a couple properties of this. It's future-proof. So let's say that we run a differentially private algorithm. From this, even if we knew which were the two possible adjacent data sets, and all we care about is learning about the data of the one person who is uh, not in both, uh, both of those databases, no matter what we learn in the future won't erode the privacy guarantee that we got at the beginning. So you can't leverage this to make things worse in post-processing. Also, we understand how differentially private algorithms compose. That's the formal term for saying, what is the cumulative privacy loss as we run through one differentially private algorithm after another with their own privacy parameters? We understand how it uh, composes. It composes gracefully, automatically, and adaptively. 
So the fact that the adversary or the analyst gets to ask her questions based on previous uh, questions and answers doesn't harm anything. There may or may not be time to tell you about the importance of that observation later. Um, as a result, because we understand composition, we can now program in a differentially private way. What that means is we can create little differentially private building blocks, little basic, you know, primitives, and now we can put them together in creative and interesting ways to carry out complicated computations while trying to minimize the, pri the cumulative privacy loss. And that is really what sets differential privacy aside from all other techniques, because in some sense you can do, well, potentially the sky's the limit. So now we get to fairness. The concern in algorithmic fairness is the following. We have a population which is diverse. There are ethnic divisions, religious divisions, geographic, medical, gender, class, sexual preference, and all sorts of things. And what we want is we want to have algorithms that are somehow fair. Now, we will spend some time thinking about how to define fair, but you all probably have some sort of intuitive notion of what fair means. Now, how would you get, how would you be sure that your algorithm is not, uh, say, discriminating on the basis of sex? So one possibility might be to hide the sensitive information from the algorithm, just not have that information as one of the inputs, not have it in the description of Cynthia, for example. And that doesn't work. And the reason is um, sensitive attributes can be sort of holographically embedded in our data. And a classic example of this is uh, the correlation between race and zip code, which comes up in redlining, uh, which was a, an illegal practice of in, in the housing loan industry um, where uh, zip codes were being used as proxies for race. And I strongly recommend reading Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, uh, talking about the history of this and showing that this was de jure, not just de facto, and that it was a result of government actions, which has a lot of implications uh, legally. Okay. Now, um, another problem with the idea of hiding the sensitive information is that algorithms that have more information can do a better job. So suppose you have a, um, a minority group in which hearing voices is um, 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 a common religious experience, but in the majority community, hearing voices is diagnostic of schizophrenia. So, Given that somebody is hearing voices, one of the first things you'd want to know is, hey, is this a normal religious experience for you or in your community um, before jumping to conclusions? So a culturally aware algorithm will be more accurate. Now, I'm going to introduce my majority and my minority groups for the rest of the talk. My majority, so the population is divided according to what herbs we like to use for flavoring our food. And the majority likes to use thyme, and the minority likes to use sage, and they'll be referred to as T and S, uh, respectively. Um, many algorithms in machine learning, particularly supervised machine learning, are given historical examples to learn from. So we will have data and outcomes. For example, loan applications and whether or not the loan was granted. And the goal of the algorithm is to figure out, to the best of its ability, how to measure, how to imitate what has been done in the past. So you can see that if there were biased decisions in the past, then this bias will be just imbibed in the mother's milk of training data. And um, uh, so you have, to, you have to do something to watch out for this. And this brings up a really serious problem, which is, in general, when we think about these things, we don't have a source of ground truth. We know what was done in the past or how things would have been done in the past, but we don't know what should be done, what's the right thing to be done, what's the accurate thing to be done. 
So I'm going to focus specifically on classification algorithms. Um, so this is um, from the Sistine Chapel. This is God deciding who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. It's a binary classification. But there's also risk assessment scoring, the scoring notion. So in this case, the goal is to classify arrested children according to some measure of risk. Children are scored, for example, based on their, um, their current offense, their previous offenses. They'll have points deducted if there are mitigating circumstances, but they end up with a score um, that, that, that is supposed to say something about uh, how likely they are to, I don't know exactly what the risk is that's being measured here. So sometimes these scores are translated into binary decisions. In this case, the binary decision is whether you should detain the child or release the child. Um, so you can have scoring algorithms, they can be turned into binary classification algorithms. So now let's try some definitions of fairness with these motivating scenarios in mind. Broadly speaking, there are two general kinds of definitions. One is group fairness, and one is individual fairness. So group fairness is the first thing that will come to everybody's mind, so we'll give some examples, or at least one example. These are statistical properties about the treatment of the groups as a whole. So one of them, which I called here statistical parity, it's also called demographic parity in the literature, says that, say in the binary classification setting, the demographics of the people with a positive classification should be the same as the demographics of those in the general population. If a third of your population is sage eating, then a third of the people that you give loans to should be sage eating. And similarly, a third of the people that you deny should be sage eating. That's demographic parity. It's a very normal, natural notion. For the most part, it's like a red flag in the breach. So if you find that the sage eaters are being disproportionately turned down for loans, then maybe it's an indication of, uh, of bias and you might want to investigate further. But it's not necessarily so meaningful when we actually have demographic parity. So one example would be in an advertising setting in which, let's say, you're advertising a spa. And you really don't want the sage eaters at your spa. So, but you have to advertise to them in proportion for the population. So what you do is you advertise to the sage eaters who can't afford your spa. And you advertise to the time eaters who can. And now you preserve your discrimination while appearing to have uh, complied with the demographic parity. So, Another issue that arises is sometimes called fairness gerrymandering. So let's say that the algorithm has demographic parity with respect to uh, sage eaters and time eaters, and maybe it has demographic parity with respect to coffee drinkers and tea drinkers, but it's really uh, not treating the tea drinking Sorry, the coffee. <laughs> it's not treating the tea drinking sage eaters very well. So they're disproportionately discriminated against. Um, and that's a problem. That's just, that says, oh my gosh, I might have had, you know, 10 attributes and now I have two to the 10. I have 1,024 things I have to look at. So. Another issue. I'm not going to go through uh, other definitions, other notions of group fairness, but another issue is that group fairness criteria, each of which are very desirable, may be mutually incompatible, and you can't have all of them at once. And this is at the heart of the um, um, uh, controversy su surrounding recidivism prediction algorithms, and uh, a particular controversy surrounding recidivism prediction algorithms. And again, I invite you to ask about that. Okay. So a different notion is individual fairness. And the intuition behind individual fairness is that people who are similar with respect to a given classification task should be classified similarly. So in order to make any sense of this whatsoever, we have to understand for a given classification task, what does it mean to be similar or dissimilar? 
How do we figure out how dissimilar people are? So credit scores, in some sense, are an effort to do this. If people are very different in credit scores, then we feel that they are very different when it comes to their eligibility for loans. If they're very similar, then we think they should be treated similarly. So we need the right notion of dissimilarity, and we need to get our hands on it. And another issue here is that you might think that, oh, gee, there are going to be these boundary cases. It's like if you've graded students, you've got students who are very similar, and one of them is going to get an A, and the other one's going to get a B, and what are you going to do about this? So imagine that credit scores, for example, are sort of smeared uh, neatly across the population, so there aren't big gaps in credit scores. So you'll have a pair of people, uh, U and V, one of whom is going to get the loan approved, and the other one will not, and yet they're really, really close to each other in, this, in, in their credit scores. So, problem, you have to draw the line somewhere. But not if you were thinking about flipping coins. What you can do instead is you can map individuals to probability distributions over the outcomes, and you can require that similar people have similar probability distributions over outcomes. Just as we did with differential privacy when we required that similar databases would have similar probabilities. Uh, distributions. So, of course, a big problem still is where do you get your metric from? But also, what should the metric capture? So, let's say that we have a nice news company, and we have uh, some notion, okay, an individual X is going to apply for a job at nice news, X will interact with the environment there. There's randomness in the environment. There's randomness in X's life. But there's a well-defined probability. You can't find it, but there's a well-defined probability that X will succeed in the job where, let's say, success is something very specific, stays in the job two years, has at least one promotion during that time. So what we would want is that if pi, the probability of success for X and Y are very similar to each other, then they should have similar probabilities of being classified as higher by an algorithm. Makes perfect sense. Similar people should be treated similarly. But what if the environment is hostile to sage eaters? So this is not nice news, this is nasty news. And now what should the metric be measuring? If there, should it be measuring talent? Should it be measuring their probability of success the way it was before? They are not the same thing anymore. You need some judgment here. So this is a very uh, poorly explored area so far, but that I hope to change this semester. So we've seen sort of group fairness notions and individual fairness notions. There's now work on trying to bridge the gap. And uh, one of the simplest approaches it's not going to seem super simple, but I promise you this is the simplest version of it, is something called multi-accuracy, proposed by Eber Johnson, Kim, Reingold, and Roth. So imagine a world where each individual is holding a secret coin. Uh, the coin is biased. It captures the individual, this individual's probability of, let's say, defaulting on a loan. So some people will have very low probabilities of defaulting because they're very organized and they're very secure financially in many ways, big families, outreach network, and so on. Other people are in much more precarious situations. So that's captured by the different biases of the coin. Bias is not an evil term here. I just mean it's not a fair coin, not, not a 50-50 coin. Now, we, our algorithm is going to try to learn to estimate the bias of each person's coin, but it doesn't actually get to see coins, it just gets to see the results of various coin flips. This is the historical data. So this is learning how to predict, predict risk based on training data. So I've seen many, many people who look a lot like you in terms of um, financials, and those people, uh, you know, about, about a third of them default on the loan, so I'm gonna guess that your probability of defaulting is about a third. That's what's going on there. That's perfectly fine. So you could ask, you, you could say that um, a prediction algorithm is approximately, has approximately accurate expectation for a group 
S, like the sage eaters, if the predictions when I take, when I average them over the elements of S are approximately accurate. So that sounds pretty good, but it turns out for technical reasons it's not as nice as it seems. So instead, the requirement is strengthened that they require a multi-accurate expectation for a collection of groups. What that means is for every group that's listed in this collection, it's going to be approximately accurate have approximately accurate expectation for that group. So that tends to make things a lot better, I, although I didn't have a chance to explain why it was a weak notion when I was only looking at one set. And the nice thing about this is that these kinds of predictors can be constructed via machine learning techniques for large enough sets in the collection. So if our sets are things like the sage eaters, the thyme eaters, the sage eating co coffee drinkers, people who wear purple, and so on, this is, uh, you're going to get something that's pretty nice for all of these groups, which is great. But which groups should you actually be thinking about? So this is also the question that you would ask yourself if somebody hands you a predictor and says, and a whole bunch of data and says, go ahead, audit my predictor and see if it's behaving well. Here's the data. See if it's behaving fairly. You probably would think, well, I'll be sure that it's you know, even-handed with respect to men and women and sage eaters and time eaters and coffee drinkers and tea drinkers and people who wear dresses versus um, people who, who prefer pants and all sorts of things and straight and not straight and so on. So which groups? Now, the problem that I was really struggling with over the summer was how do you know that you're supposed to look at a particular group? So if you have a disadvantaged group, an oppressed group, you can't expect them to stand up and say, look at us, we're not being treated fairly. They may have actually taken in the message that they are supposed to be underachieving. So how do you use technology somehow to step outside the frame of reference and be sure you're checking all of the right things or demanding all of the right group be, groups to be covered. So this is where we say complexity theory rocks. We don't have to actually list these groups. We can classify them implicitly. We can say, I want to consider all groups that can be defined by small circuits or little tiny programs. Well, simple programs, let's say. Very simple programs. Now, if you do that, all of the machinery works. You will almost surely capture all of the normal uh, types of discrimination that people think about, but you'll also have a net for many more types catch them in your net as well. So um, uh, this is why I fell in love with the multi-accuracy and its, uh, um, general, its, its strengthening to what's called multi-calibration. Um, because it gave me an answer to this question of how do you decide which groups you should be looking at? You don't have to. And an interesting psychology question is, you know, is it how how much work do we do computationally when we are discriminating? Do we do a lot of work to place someone into the bin of discriminate against them, or is it a very easy computation in our mind? And my conjecture is that it's a simple computation, but I don't know. The flip side of this also is if there is a group that's discriminated against, but it, you have to compute really hard to find them, maybe in practice it's just not happening that much. Okay. so. Um, the last couple of minutes I'll spend on affirmative action, uh, group remedies. And again, this also is very much uh, in progress. So one way that we can do f affirmative action is if we have rankings. And there are real life examples of this. So in the University of Texas and in the University of California system, um, Students who are ranked in the top 10% of their own high school's class are uh, automatically uh, given, granted admission to one of the state universities. Okay. 
So uh, that's great. And there is another example of similar but more nuanced thinking by um, uh, John Romer, who talked about stratifying students according to the education level of the mother. And within each stratum, uh, ranking each student by the number of hours they spend on homework per week. And then taking to the university the top appropriately chosen K percent from each stratum. So you fix K so that the number of admitted students is the right answer. So, and his point was that a student who comes from an uneducated home may not even realize it's possible to spend 10 or 15 hours a week on homework. They've never maybe seen it modeled. Now, a different way, uh, if you don't have, if you have a, um, a metric, is something like this, and this is highly simplified. Suppose for this simple version of it, we have the same number of sage eaters and time eaters. And we have a distance for each sage eater, we know how far they are from each time eater. The idea is that we will pair up the sage eaters and the time eaters so that we minimize the sum of the distances of over for each sage eater, how far it is to its corresponding time eater. And then we will classify the sage eater by we first learn how to classify the time eaters, and then when we want to classify a sage eater, we just follow it to its paired up time eater and we see how they're classified. So we do something like that. We use earth mover distances, and the sage eaters are mapped to distributions over time eaters, and similar sage eaters are mapped similarly. Okay. So, so that actually works, but again, there's this problem where does the metric come from? Okay. So, we know how to handle multiple disjoint minority groups. If we have a metric, we just do the same things for both, for, for the multiple different groups. And I should point out here that if, let's say, a third of the time eaters are given loans, then a third of the sage eaters will because of that one-to-one -one matching. And that also happens in the more rigorous version. If we don't have a metric, quite surprisingly, we can build something which we call a fair ranking from any multi-accurate predictor, and then we can play those ranking games that were done, say, by the University of California. Uh, right, okay. So the intersectional case, though, remains open. We don't know how to do these affirmative action games, uh, games, I mean, strategies, if our sets of, of minority groups uh, intersect. And of course, that's the really interesting case when you have someone who is both a sage eater and a rosemary eater. Um, so, okay, so I think I'm out of time. And so I will skip to the end. And uh, be happy to take some questions.